Jacob spent ten thousand dollars on tickets so him and i could go out to ufc 303 and see the greatest comeback in the history of sports but then conor mcgregor went out there and broke his baby toe and he is no longer fighting we do get a light heavyweight title fight for the main event we do get a newly added co-main event and i am still looking forward very much so to seeing ufc 303 live my name is angelo this is we want picks and i'm going to break down the entire ufc 303 fight card giving you my picks predictions, and bets. Before we talk about UFC 303, let me spend five seconds and brag about UFC Saudi Arabia. We dominated. Every single bet that I put out into the universe came back with a W and even more money. A 100% hit rate on all the bets that I put out there for UFC Saudi Arabia. Jakey Boy hit his underdog lock of the week and went 10 and one on picks. If you want to get ahead of the curve and see all the bets, all the picks, the round line leans, the tools, and more now, For UFC 303, just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It's only $10 an entire month. You will get UFC 303. You will get the Macy Barber fight card. You're going to get everything you need instantly for an entire month. Wewantpicks.com, click become a member. If you want some more details and insight into UFC Saudi Arabia, check out the Home Alone face thumbnail. And I get it. The Home Alone face is a little bizarre for a grown man to do. But the rest of this thumbnail is pretty sweet, honestly. I sat here in Photoshop, made that thumbnail, was proud as hell, and then recorded a 35-minute video recapping UFC Saudi Arabia. If you want a little more insight, a little more thoughts, reactions, visceral feelings, just check out this thumbnail. We filmed this video after every single fight card. But it's not just UFC Saudi Arabia that we dominated and did well at. My safety parlay, the parlay that is available for premium members, does very well in pay-per-views. It is 11-2 and in the last nine pay-per-views. And before you come at me thinking that you're a janitor at MIT in the 90s, I do more than one safety parlay occasionally. So in nine pay-per-views, the last nine pay-per-views, I did 13 safety parlays and 11 of them hit. I am on a four event win streak right now. And while the hot is ironing, you should ride that train. And I said that backwards. And that's because sometimes I'm a silly goose. 70% event win rate, a 25% lifetime ROI. This is just one single bet. This is not the entirety of premium membership. This is literally one of many things that we offer. You can unlock the safety parlay. Just go to wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top. You will instantly unlock all the bets. The tools, one of those tools is the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, the win probability, and the line movement for every fighter on every card. This card, UFC 303, has had a lot of line movement already. Cub Swanson opened at a minus 140 favorite. He is sitting at a plus 170 underdog. There are some other flips on this card as well. You will also unlock the detailed data metrics and analytics. This is 38 columns of information that you can use hopping in and prop bets, out of prop bets, avoiding spots. You will very quickly see biometrics right next to striking stats and fighters on top of each other so you can work your finger across and find those gaps. You will also get the DraftKings Optimizer. This will build DraftKings lineups for you. This will build 150 lineups for you. A couple clicks of the button, And then a lineup spits out. It is preloaded with the best ownership projections on planet Earth, as well as the scoring projections and more. You're also going to get more than just myself and Jakey Boy. We have other analysts on Premium Member breaking down fights, giving you their picks and their bets. Artem is breaking down far more than just the UFC. He's breaking down PFL, Bellator, KSW, the regional shows. And then we have an artificial intelligence. I literally, there is a nuclear physicist that reached out to me and said, hey, love the show. I'm a huge UFC fan. Look at what I can build. And then he built it. And now we have it. Pick GPT is the artificial intelligence picking fights based solely off of historical data. And it is doing so at a remarkable accuracy. We are then taking what the robot says and building betting programs around it. We have two different betting systems. One is based off of the confidence that the artificial intelligence picks, and the other one is based off of some other percentage systems. You can unlock every single thing that we have right now for only $10 a month. Go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top for $10 an entire month. I will be at UFC 303. Jakey Boy was kind enough to buy us tickets, and he bought them at the premium price point because it was supposed to be a Conor McGregor card, his big comeback. He paid $10,000 for two tickets. They did refund a portion of his money once that fight dropped. They reached out. 
I don't know if it was that of the kindness of UFC's heart or because of the new laws in Las Vegas, but they reached out and they were like, hey, pal, sorry about that. We know that this fundamentally changed and we know that we marked it up. They gave him three options when they reached out. They said, we can give you a partial refund and you still get to go to the event. We can give you a full refund. Nothing ever happened. Here's all your money back. Or you can move the money that you spent to a future card and we'll just credit you. You can keep it that way. He chose a partial refund. We're still going. The hotels are booked. The flights are booked. We're still going. So he said, you know what? Yeah, give me some of my money back. I know I paid a premium for a Connor card and it's not a Connor card. Take a guess what the percentage that they offered back was. I will pause for three seconds. Bop, bop, bop. 45%. I was surprised when he asked me, when he said, what do you think they offered me? I was like, ah, probably 20%. 45%. They basically, when Conor McGregor was on the card, charged double what they would normally charge. This is still an international fight week card. It still has a title fight on it. And they double the price when Conor McGregor shows up. That is absolutely wild to me. Either way, we will be at UFC 303. If you see us there, come say hi. If you say hi, I'll buy you a drink. It's just that simple. I look like this. This is what I look like in real life. So here's a picture of me ready to go saying hi. So you look for that. Maybe a hat, maybe not a hat. But this is what I look like. This is a real, you know, real life. You see me on here. I'm all dolled up for television. This, that's what I look like in real life. So... Come say hi. I'll buy you a drink. I'll probably be standing next to, uh, I'm six foot three. That's not an exaggeration. I will be standing next to, he's probably going to be shoulder height, a little more red than you would expect in real life. Um, look for that. Come say hi. You'll get a drink. And nothing crazy. Don't come over here looking for a Johnny Blue. That's not happening. Let's go ahead and break down this card though. UFC 303 is odd. Because it is surrounded in disappointment. It was supposed to be the Conor McGregor card. So now we are all grossly disappointed in the card that it is right now. But the reality is, it is still a good pay-per-view. The main event is solid, and we will break that down. The co-main event is very good. We have Ian Gary taking on Michael Venom Page. There was a lot of good fights on this card. It's not what it was supposed to be, but it's honestly better than most. And let's go ahead and break it down. Opening up. The UFC 303 fight card. We have Ricky Simone taking on Vinicius Oliveira. And this is an interesting fight to break down because Ricky Simone's on a bit of a losing streak and that always worries me just a touch. But he is still very good. He's a high energy wrestling beast. He's gonna dive at legs with 100% energy over and over until he gets a takedown and even potentially a submission. His biggest asset is his gas tank, his willingness to stick to that wrestle heavy game plan. He's not a technical striker, but it is there to set up his takedowns. We've seen some flashes of power from him in the past. He's got a handful of knockdowns, but he typically is not striking long enough for it to even matter. He is coming off of the second loss in a row, this time a decision to Mario Batista, where honestly, Ricky Simone fought well and looked good, but Mario Batista just fought unbelievable. He just wasn't the better fighter on that day. He's taking on Vinicius Oliveira. This guy's really fun. He charges forward. He throws everything at the wall looking for a finish. He is sloppy, but he's dangerous. He's not just chaos on the feet. He can be chaos on the ground as well. You can get it to the ground, and if he gets it to the ground, he's just going to be raining down hammer fists. He wins fights with aggression, power, and creativity. He's coming off that win over Bernardo Sopai where he was taken down three times, but he ended up finding the finish in the third round. I came into this breakdown. I was ready to go. I was expecting to fade Ricky Simone. I've been watching this sport long enough to know that it is very hard for some of these guys to rebound after those little losing streaks. These guys do well. They rise into the top. They lose a couple of good ones in a row. And then it's just a rocky road after that. I, we've seen that time and time again. And that's what I was expecting here for Ricky Simone. He's very good. He was on a five-fight win streak. He was likely one or two wins away from a title shot. And now he's on a two-fight skid. And they are quality losses to quality opponents. It's always hard to get your career back on track. But then I re-watched Vinicius' last fight. And those takedowns were just way too damn easy. Ricky Simone is a very good wrestler. You can trust him to wrestle. He's not one of these guys that has wrestling, but is just going to end up striking. No, he is going to wrestle no matter what. We've seen Vinicius get taken down with relative ease. I think Ricky Simone wins this fight. Just old school, crotch sniffing, forward pressure and takedowns. We watch Vinicius get taken down. 
Ricky Simone can do the takedowns. That is probably what's going to happen here. I'm still on the fence money-wise because I do just have that feeling like, yeah, this might be the decline. Like, the dude was 20 and 3. Looking great. Lost a couple of close ones, and it's like, oh, man. What if Venetia stays tough? Will Ricky Simone keep coming forward? Either way, he is going to be the pick. I do trust the wrestling. We'll see what happens with the prop bets when they drop those takedown lines. Then we have Carlos Hernandez taking on UFC newcomer Rai Tusuria. And this is another really fun fight. I came here expecting like, okay, we're going to get another one of these road to the UFC guys that are a little more hyped than they should be. The road to the UFC, it's a tournament. It's a tournament in Asia. They bring in a bunch of local talent. They all fight each other to the top. And they're trying to build superstars in very populated regions. Pretty straightforward game plan for the UFC. And a couple of them, like Rinya Nakamura, for example, break out and turn into actual stars that can translate the tournament success into the true UFC. And that's what they're trying to do here with Rai Tsuruya. I, I was hoping it was like Tatsura because that's much easier. This is a real tongue twister. T-S is Tsuruya. To Suyuruya. I mean, there's, there's just no way. There was no way I was going to do that correctly. In, in no world do I, who already fumbles every now and then, was going to come in here, Angie one take, go ride to Suyuruya. And it was going to be no big deal, move on, and there wasn't anybody commenting about it. But this should be an interesting fight, not necessarily a competitive fight. Because while Carlos Hernandez is pretty good, He's a grappler. Striking is just okay. His striking, he is pretty solid in his accuracy. He does have some deceiving power. He's not the most technically sound guy, but he's got a nice jab, a straight right that follows behind it. And he's another one of these guys that does have good jujitsu, but trash wrestling. He'll take shots, but they're usually stuffed. And then he ends up working on the upper body and trying to drag or trip from there. He has been known to throw up some Hail Mary submissions like flying triangles. And he is coming off of that finished loss to Tatsura, Tyra, see how much easier that one is to say? There's a T in the middle. That's so much easier. But he's taking on UFC newcomer Rai Rai. This guy's a nasty grappler. He's got solid hands, good aggression. His takedowns are slick, and they are big. He'll take your back standing. He'll pick you up. He'll slam you to the ground. He will instantly transition to ground and pound and look for the finish. He's got a ton of cardio. Plenty of composure. He's a guy that can really make something happen if he stays on this trajectory. If his career continues to do what it's been doing, he's going to be the next big thing. And when I first saw it was a UFC debut, only nine fights, minus 400 favorite, I was like, okay, here's we're going to fade. And then I watched the tape, and I was like, how is he only minus 400 and not minus 800? Rai seems to be the real deal, and this is a tailor-made matchup for him. Rai's going to be the pick. And if I didn't have the safety parlay policy where I don't use UFC newcomers, he would be in it. I am very confident in Rai, T-S-U-R-U-I-A, to win this fight. I think the grappling is just far too good. The striking is far too good. And Carlos isn't dangerous enough. His Hail Mary submissions can be slick, but I don't think his Hail Mary submissions are going to matter here. Rai is just too good of a grappler. Very high confidence in him. You will likely see him in a parlay with one or two other fighters on this card. He is not in the safety parlay because UFC debuts just be doing UFC debut stuff every now and then. If you do want to see the bet the very second that I place it, if you are a premium member, make sure you click on account and then click on link Discord. Once the Discord is linked, we can push notifications through that app. If you're not a premium member, become one. It's freaking $10. Don't be a cheap bastard. The amount of tools, insight, information that you get are just literally unrivaled. Doesn't exist in this space anywhere on the planet you're gonna get like a couple of patreon bets you're gonna get like some half-ass website that doesn't work or you're gonna get an insanely easy to use quick loading website that has more tools insight and options you could ever want or need heading into fight week we won't pix.com click become a member at the top then we have a 45 year old andre orlovsky taking on martin budai listen i'm 40 Okay, I'm no spring chicken, but, I, you know, I take care of myself. Camera, I, they're so big, I don't even fit in the street. I take care of myself. I train. I do all the things. I mean, this is a tight-fitting shirt. You can see I'm, I'm, I'm yoked up. And it's not very often that at 40 years old, I get to see professional athletes my age or older, they're typically in their 20s or 30s. But here we are with a 45-year-old Andre Arlovsky. And this guy's a legend. 
If you're new to this sport and you showed up during COVID, welcome. We appreciate you. It's a great sport. We're happy to have you. Just don't be that weirdo loser in the comments that has something negative to say every week. Don't be that guy. But welcome. And let me give you a little history lesson on Andre Lofsky. At one point in time, he was the baddest man on this planet. He was a former UFC heavyweight champion. In an era where we just had some like big boy brawlers, Andre Orlovsky showed up with actual skills and athleticism. He's got a Sambo background, but he had hands like a freight train. He's knocking people out left and right. I actually watched him fight live at UFC 55. Not 155, UFC 55 at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut 19 years ago. I watched him fight live. He knocked out Paul Buentello in like four and a half seconds. He was absolutely unbeatable in his prime. He is all, for sure a Hall of Famer, without question a Hall of Famer. And he's still a good fighter. He's 45 years old. So all the things that you imagine are fading are fading. Chin is gone. Cardio is still there, but he didn't really need cardio. He's not a high energy kind of guy. But the skills are there. He's a clean boxer. He's got decent kicks. He's just... I, He's got to be one or two fights away from retirement. He might retire on the spot after this fight. It's crazy. It's crazy that he's 45 years old. And heavyweights do have longer careers than some of the other weight classes, but it is crazy that he's still out there doing his thing. If his chin holds up, he can beat a lot of people still because he moves forward. He has clean boxing, all the veteran savvy in the world. He can grapple as well, holding you against the cage, doing all the things. Obviously, he is 45, and the chin has not been holding up. He has every single skill that you could ever want or need or that you could amass over a 25-year MMA career. But again, Chin's not necessarily holding up. He's taking on Martin Budai. This guy is a powerful striker with heavy hands. He's got 11 stoppage wins, solid footwork, and he throws everything with intent. He averages almost six significant strikes landed per minute. But he himself can be hittable and he can be a slow starter. He is coming off that TKO loss to Shamil Gaziv where he could not handle the forward pressure. And Andre did go from one of the scariest guys on planet Earth to a bit of a pitter-patter guy. When he was out there doing his thing, everybody was terrified of his power. That power seems to be long gone, which is odd because typically when you age in this sport, power is the last thing that goes. You keep the power. The chin goes first, the power stays. But Andre sort of went away from the power about seven, eight years ago. And he started to protect his chin and started to play that outside pitter-patter, hold against the cage, high IQ, veteran savvy kind of game. So he is no longer this terrifying man. And because he's not terrifying and there's not much risk going right at him, I think Martin Budai is just going to go right at him. I think he's going to move forward, throw with intent, probably connect and knock out Martin Budai. Martin Budai is going to be the pick. I am likely betting on him as well. I would love, though, if Andre Olofsky won that. I would love it. How could you not? I've been watching this guy for 20 years. How could I not be rooting for him? So I am rooting for him. I do want him to win. At a certain point, you are just too old for this sport. And even if he was younger, even let's say he was 35, Martin Budai is very good. He was a bit exposed in his last fight, but it wasn't his skills necessarily. It was his cardio. And Gazeev is good. He looks like a troll that lives under a bridge, but he's pretty good. So unfortunately, I think Andre Olofsky probably gets knocked out in this fight. Then we have Michelle Waterson Gomez. I'm just leaving the Gomez off. It doesn't fit on the graphics. I'm not going to make all the font tiny. and weird. We all know her as the karate hottie. She's been Michelle, Michelle Waterson for 15 years. We're just leaving it like that. And expect the similar experience when we break down Ian Gary. And she's taking on Jillian Robertson. Michelle Waterson, a.k.a. the karate hottie, has been a professional fighter for 15 years years. She's got a ton of cage time. She has fought some of the best women on planet Earth. She has fought multiple champions like Rose Nama Yunus, Carla Esparza, Joanna Jerzejczyk. Style-wise, she's a slick striker who uses kicks and distance well, and she'll work in a touch of wrestling here or there. While she is firmly, like Andre Orlovsky, in the twilight of her career, she does still have skills and some veteran savvy. She's taking on Jillian Robertson. Jillian Robertson is one of the most dangerous grapplers in the division. She actually has the most submission wins in strawweight history. Her striking is not great. Her takedowns are okay. And obviously her jujitsu is very slick. 
and can be a problem for a lot of people. She has that 43% takedown accuracy. Oftentimes, she's going to rely on her opponents to take it to the ground so that she can work. She is coming off that second round finish win over Pollyanna Viana. And I love Michelle Waterson. I've been watching her for years. She's been very entertaining. She was on, what is it, the Ninja Warrior? What is it? American Ninja Warrior. She was on that. I was pumped when she was on that. I'm like, here we go, UFC represent. And then she jumped from like one square, bang, fell in the water, and that was the end of that. And unfortunately, the last couple of years haven't been great to her. She went from the karate hottie, who was durable and a creative striker, to the carpool mommy, who's got a Karen cut. This picture is not new. Her new haircut is like, they use a trimmer. It's like, zzz, they use a trimmer on half her head. Full-blown Karen, I need to speak to the manager because I didn't win my fight energy. And that sucks because she is a talented fighter. She's got incredible body movement. She can work in and out. She was typically very, very durable. But she is one and four in her last five. She is looking to get back on track, and I don't see it happening. I think she is full mom mode, and this is how she makes her money. So I'm going to show up. I'm going to fight. She's looking to win, but I think what's happened over the last 10 years is while your body starts to decline, that just literally happens, right? You get older, you're not as strong, you're not as fast, you're not as, that's just what happens in life. And while that's happening to her, she's having kids and getting married, like life is changing around her. And this is a very selfish sport. This is not a sport where you can be selfless and give energy and effort to the people around you. This has to be a very selfish sport where you dedicate almost every single minute. There are anomalies like Robert Whitaker, who has 39 kids and went out there and sparked that dude. But I do think Michelle Waterson is at the end of her career. I think Michelle Waterson is coming out here looking to win. She's putting in the time. She's putting in the effort. But I think the sport is passing her by. I think the people like Jillian Robertson, who are in the gym three times a day grinding through it, are going to pass her up. I think Jillian's going to get the win here. I think she will grind forward, probably get a takedown, work from there. And Michelle Waterson will hang tough and she'll spin and she'll do the kicks and the moves. But I don't think it's going to work here. Jillian Robertson is going to be the pick. Medium confidence in her. The only reason it's not high confidence is she can be submission or bust. She's a bit of a submission or bust person. And Jillian Robertson does have the most amount of submission wins in UFC women's strawweight history. We'll see what happens with the prop bets. Let's see what the prop bets are. Let's see what the round line is. And then we'll go from there. Then we have, by far, the biggest favorite on this card. We got Peyton Talbot taking on Giannis Yamori. And Peyton Talbot, if you just look at these records, all right, 8-0, and 12-2, that's a good record. How is he a minus 1,500 favorite? Nah, and I'm about to tell you how. Because this dude is a very real prospect. The UFC is going to be looking to build him up. He's a flashy striker. He's got a lot of movement and good power. He's very tall for this division, not like insanely so. He's not some weirdo with tiny little legs like this because he wants to be six feet tall at 125 pounds. You know who I'm talking about, Jose Johnson. But he is tall for this weight class. He's a flashy striker, lots of movement, lots of power. He does a really good job using that length, using that reach. He'll throw out one twos at an incredible pace, and then he finds those big shots. He's got solid takedown defense, and if he is taken down, he stays busy enough and looks to work his way back up. He can be outgrappled, though. You go digging into the regional tape. You can see fights where he was getting outgrappled. He ended up winning those fights, but there were times, there were moments, there were entire rounds where he was being taken down and controlled. He has the composure and power that you would want or need and it will be interesting to see what happens to his career. He may have some trouble with a Dagestani-style wrestler, but that's not this matchup. He's taking on Giannis Kamori. Giannis Kamori is a patient striker. He's got fantastic leg kicks. He likes to own the center of the octagon and figure out range, and then he'll work your legs. Once he gauges that range, he starts to commit to strikes. He'll add a little bit of power into the cycle. He'll work in a takedown or two, but it's mostly reactionary when he does get takedowns, he's looking for control. He wants to slow the action down. He's not the most dangerous guy, but he is patient. He is technical. He's got solid fight IQ. He's coming off the third round finish loss to William Gomez in his UFC debut. Dude got finished by William Gomez. He's not winning this fight. Like the graphic says, Peyton Talbot. And this is a picture of him. But you might have seen the odds and been like, where's Bo Nickel? Looking for a picture of Bo Nickel. Minus 1500 is crazy. It's crazy. These are still fist fights at the end of the day. For conversation's sake, 
Minus 1,500, here's the math lesson for you, translates to a 94% win probability. And I think that Peyton Talbot wins this fight 94% of the time. So I think the odds are good. He's insanely talented. He's very dynamic. He's athletic. He's well-rounded. He's fun. He's literally everything that you want in a young fighter. And this should be another showcase fight for him. Peyton's going to be the pick. There's no value in the money line. Like, that's it. You don't parlay a minus 1,500. Don't. It probably wins. But what are you going to do? Add 30 cents to your payout? And, and that comes with some risk. The 6% risk, let's say you just look at the odds literally. Minus 1,500, it means 94% win probability. There's a 6% probability he loses, just according to the numbers. The 30 cents that you'll add to your parlay are not worth that 6%. Just leave it alone, leave them out. Maybe you'll save a little bit of money on a prop bet. So let's see what happens when those drop. Then we have Charles Air Jordan taking on Jean Silva. This should be a really fun fight because Charles Jourdain is a very fun guy to watch. He's a come forward striker who always has a great chin. He's incredibly fast. He's got great timing. He's willing to take chances and he'll throw out some spinning attacks, flying knees and do all the things. He's not the most technical guy in the world, but he is one of the most exciting. He's an absolute dog who will keep fights ugly and in your face. He is though, coming off that close loss to Sean Woodson where he went 0 for 4 in takedowns and just overall had a really hard time with the reach. He's taking on Jean Silva. This guy's a very powerful striker who is loose and creative. The creativity is fun to watch, but it does get him into some weird positions at times. He's interesting to watch because he'll go from a tight guard to just loose hands down, but he does alternate between those two often enough to get people guessing what's going on. He lowers his level like he's going to shoot a takedown, but then he just blasts the body and then comes up top. His takedown defense is solid, his striking is killer, and he's coming off that knockout win over Weston Wilson in his UFC debut. This should be a really fun fight between two guys who take chances and prefer to strike. But if I'm Charles Jourdain's coach, right? Here's me, all French. Hey, we oui, we oui. Make the fight boring. Close the distance, hold against the cage, don't strike with him. That that was like that was like Portuguese. That was not French. I'm sorry. I can't do a French accent. But he does need to close that distance and hold Jean against the cage. He needs to hold him against the cage. If there's distance, Jean Silva is 10 times the more powerful striker. He's the better, more technical striker. Do not fight a striking game. Nope. That, do not engage in a distance striking match with Jean Silva. He's the better striker. He's going to light you up. Hold him against the cage, working a takedown. Problem is, Charlie has a 10% takedown and success rate. 10%. So he's not going to get the takedowns. He's not going to have the cage control, and he's going to lose this fight. Jean Silva's going to be the pick because if it's a striking match, he's the better striker, and it's just literally that simple for me. Obviously, Charles Jourdain has the better resume, fought the higher level of competition, but at the end of the day, you're in a fist fight. You're going to have to land the punches. John Silva hits hard, good technical striker, should win this fight. John Silva is the pick. Then we have a, a battle of the veterans, if you will. Andre Feely's 34 years old, but he's been around the block. He's fought a couple of people. Cub Swanson, 40 years old. My man, fellow 40-year-old Cub Swanson. And this is some of the biggest line movement we've had on the card. Cub Swanson open at a minus 140 favorite. He was the favorite. The odds makers were like, yes, the grizzled veteran is going to win this fight. Let's set the line at minus 140. And then all the money came in. He's now a plus 170 underdog. And Andre Feely is almost a two to one favorite in this matchup. And I can understand that age does matter. But here's a little insight that I got from the nuclear physicist that developed our artificial intelligence. He uses historical data, right? He gets data from the internet, strikes landed on every single fight and how long the fight went and biometrics. All this data goes into the artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence analyzes all the data, looks at the outcomes of historical fights, compares the data and is like, oh, when this happens, this happens. When this happens, that happens. And during the USADA era, the younger fighter won 60 something percent of the time. So if you did nothing else other than just pick the younger fighter during the USADA era, you were correct way more than half the time. But USADA is gone. 
They've been gone for about seven months now. And all of a sudden, these older fighters are having a lot more success. It's a very small sample size. It's not enough to do anything meaningful with. But all of a sudden, these 40-year-olds, the 40-plus fighters, the 38-year-olds, are winning fights at a much higher percentage than they were previously. We don't know why. It's not to throw out weird accusations against Cub Swanson because he's never been a guy that has had any issues like that. But the point being, you can't just look at the age anymore and be like, this guy's old as shit. I'm picking the other side. Because all of a sudden, these older, experienced gentlemen are winning these fights. We got Cub Swanson, absolute legend. If you've been watching as long as I have, you saw him in the WEC. You saw him in the UFC. You've seen him in these wars. You've seen him do some incredible things in multiple different cages under the Zufa umbrella. And if you know what I mean by Zufa, then... You've been here as long as I have, and congratulations. He's a creative striker. He's got incredible fight IQ. He's really fun to watch. He's definitely old. He's definitely slow, but he's still crazy tough. You don't get to legend status without being pretty diverse or well-rounded. So he can wrestle as well. He can grapple. He averages one takedown per fight. Cub is the better all-around fighter in almost every matchup he's in, but age is a bitch. He's coming off that sketchy decision win over Hakeem Dawadu. That had everybody screaming that the judges were a little bit crooked. That was a, a bizarre win for sure. But he hung tough. Hakeem Dawadu, according to the world, was going to knock out Cub Swanson. But that's not what happened. Because he's a grizzled veteran. He's taking on Andre Feely. I've broken down Andre every single time. And I say the same thing every single time. He's a well-rounded guy that at one point in time was on the path to be the next big thing coming out of Team Alpha Male. He never lived up to that hype. I personally think he was pushed a little too fast too soon and his chin was gone. You get a chin, right? God just gives you a chin. You, whether Whatever God you believe in gave you a chin. A chin is not something you can train. A chin is not something like you can't earn it. It's just you can take, you either can get hit with a baseball bat like Kelvin Gastelum or you can get looked at weird and fall down like Johnny Walker. That's it. They Those two fighters cannot control that. That's just what they were given. What you can do, though, is ruin your chin. While it's developing, you can get hit too hard too early and it just never fully recovers. I feel like that's what happened to Andre Feely because he doesn't really have a chin. He does have skills, though. He's a technical striker. He's got very good wrestling. He's a very well-rounded guy. He's also insanely fun to watch. So he'll get sucked into a brawl and he'll bang. And then things won't go his way, just like his last fight where he was knocked out by Dan Ige. Andre Feely is sitting at a 2-1 to one favorite in this fight. And while... That is warranted just based off of his raw talent and his abilities. It's not an accurate representation of what we have here. Andre has no chin left whatsoever, and he doesn't wrestle as much as he should. So Andre should win this fight because Cub is 40, and Cub is slowing down, and Andre should be able to literally beat him to the punch. But Andre makes terrible decisions. Cub has high fight IQ. This is a really fun back-and-forth fight. It might go to a decision. I'm not touched. I am not touched. These odds are dumb. I am not touching this fight. I will be rooting for Cub Swanson. I wish, I do wish, if I can go back in time and and be a little fairy sitting on, I, I shouldn't have said be a little fairy. I shouldn't have said that. Oh, you're, you're. <laughs> I already see the comments. If I can go back in time and be Jiminy Cricket sitting on Andre Feely's shoulder, I'd be like, bite down on your mouthpiece, shoot some takedowns, protect your chin at all costs. His chin is gone. And that is a problem. Cub still hits hard. Two to one odds on Andre Feely is crazy to me. Crazy, not touching this fight. I do think he wins just based off of speed and talent. I'm not touching this fight. Then we have the featured prelim. We have the fraud from Philly, Joe Pfeiffer, taking on Marc-Andre Barrow. And before I get some angry comment, how could you call him a fraud? He would be, shut up, shut up. This is all in good fun, relax. Everybody's so damn sensitive. You should have seen the dissertation somebody wrote because I said Hamzat Shemaev's a clown for pulling out of three fights, missing weight, ruining multiple fight cards. Dude, relax. This is all in good fun. We're here. This is sports entertainment. This is entertainment. We're here. We're hanging out. And I called Joe the fraud from Philly. You know why? Because he's an, look at his face. He's an angry troll. This dude is the angriest guy that's ever walked the face of the earth. In every video, mm, mean mug. He had Jacob in his Instagram stories being like, this fucking ginger loser. He's just an angry boy. 
trying to get his aggression out in his fights. And I'm being facetious when I say the fraud from Philly because he's still a very good fighter. That's just so catchy to say. Joe Pfeiffer is an incredibly powerful striker. He's got slick BJJ in his back pocket. He hits like a freaking truck. He uses pressure to break people. He's got nice, clean takedowns. We saw that a couple of fights ago. His BJJ is good as well. He is coming off of that loss to Jack Hermanson where people did say it was a fraud check. He's a fraud. It's a fraud check. I'm not a big fraud check kind of guy. But he shouldn't have lost a striking match to a grappler. That is not what should have happened there. But that is what happened. The problem was, and I think what we all found out in that fight, is that Joe Pfeiffer's offensive striking is incredible. He has power. He's got speed. He is accurate. But there's no defense there at all. He doesn't move his head, not one bit. There are no kicks. So he is literally just a powerful boxer, basically Sergei Pavlovic. And what happened last night to Sergei Pavlovic? He fought a dynamic striker that moved around. He got his face lit up. That might happen here because he's taking on Mark andre Barreau. This guy's a well-rounded fighter himself. He's got solid kickboxing takedowns and jujitsu. He's typically looking to pressure forward and wear you down on your feet. He has impressive striking volume, landing almost six significant strikes per minute. He's also hit with more than five. He's not particularly powerful, so he's not dangerous, but he is busy enough and tough enough to grind out wins. He's coming off that back-and-forth loss to Chris Curtis. I do think this pick comes down to whether you think Joe Pfeiffer is a fraud or not. I know, uh, yeah, I'm just using that term for dramatics and dramatic effect, and it's going to trigger some people. And Relax. I actually don't think Joe Pfeiffer's a fraud. I think Joe Pfeiffer is a very good fighter who is very young in his career and learned a valuable lesson. So now what we're going to find out is, is Joe Pfeiffer open-minded enough to learn from that loss, or is he just going to be who he is and not evolve at all. If he is open-minded, if he's a 27-year-old guy that was rushed, I'm very emotional here, that was rushed to the top because he is a marketable guy. He does have insane power. If he's an open-minded guy, is he going to make adjustments? Is he going to come out here with actual head movement is he going to come out here protecting his face come out here not looking for one punch knockout but working his way forward and being a well-rounded mixed martial artist adding a kick or two or is he going to come out doubling down on the same thing he has ever done which is be a powerful boxer and just move forward i would like to think that at 27 years old with the entire career ahead of him he's evolving he's moving his head He's adding striking deep. Listen, he was outstruck by Jack Hermanson. That is not what should have happened in that fight. Get out grappled by the guy all day. Outstruck is not what should have happened. So that may have been his first main event, a little too much pressure, kind of frozen in the moment. Perfectly, honestly, perfectly acceptable. It may have been, yeah, listen, I, I was positive I was going to knock this guy out. He's been knocked out before. I was chasing that knockout. Bad game plan, bad on me. Perfectly acceptable. That hap Listen, this is an unforgiving sport. Almost nobody is undefeated forever. Nobody. Okay. John Jones has a fake loss. He's basically undefeated. Khabib has no losses. He is undefeated. So there's, there's flashes of it. But when we're talking about all-time greats, for the most part, no matter how good you are, no matter where you are in your career, you got a loss or you're going to get a loss. So I don't care that Joe Pfeiffer lost and the fraud from Philly stuff is just a funny thing to say. The reality is... I think he's a talented fighter. I think he hits insanely hard. And if he adds defense, and if he wrestles a little more while striking, we watched him out wrestle. I think it was Abdul Razak Al Hassan, but he didn't strike and wrestle. He only, like, you got to do it all. You got to mix it well. I think Joe, at 27 years old, has a future in front of him. I am going to pick him to win this fight. I can't touch any money here. I got to see him bounce back from that big loss first. We got to see what he does after that big loss. If this angry face that's staring at us right now had this energy in the gym after, like, I got to fix stuff. I got to be better. This is unacceptable. He's going to whoop the shit out of Marc Andre. If he came back with this angry face and he has a bunch of yes men around him and they're just making excuses and bullshit and this always, well, you guys know I was having trouble with my weight. You guys know. Then he's not going to evolve. I do think he will evolve. I do think he wins this fight. He's got plenty of power, but Marc Andre's a, a pretty tough guy. 
This is an interesting fight. One of the more interesting fights on the card because I do think Joe Pfeiffer can be somebody in this division, but we're going to have to see some striking defense out of him. And before I move on to the main card, here's a reminder. I will be at UFC 303. If you skip through the intro, you didn't know that, but I will be at UFC 303 with Jakey Boy. Come say hi. I'll buy you a drink. We get 300 something thousand views a month. Some of you are likely going to be at UFC 303. Genuinely, say hi. I'd love to meet you. I'll spend some money. I'll buy you a drink. Uh, I look exactly like this. So yeah, that's not Ben Affleck. That is me at my wedding. That's what I look like. And if you don't want to say hi in person, send us a letter. We get mail every single month. I open that mail up on the Fight Foods vlogs. Everything from packages to letters, food, all the things. Here is the address if you want to send something. It's We Want Picks. P.O. Box 406 in Prosper, Texas, 75078. And what would this be if I didn't try to give you $50? Go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. Use our links to sign up with any one of our affiliates. Make a deposit and we send you 50 bucks. It's affiliate marketing. You're going to use the link. You're going to sign up. You're going to make a deposit. They're going to pay me and then I'm going to give you $50. It is literally that simple. Let's go ahead and break down this main card. I started this whole thing by saying, Jake would spend a ton of money for us to go out there and watch Conor McGregor fight. And it's a Conor McGregor fight card. And it's supposed to be, according to Conor, the greatest comeback in the history of sports. And I was bought in. You know, I'm going to make a comparison here and you guys are going to, because everybody takes everything way too literally. It's almost like watching Michael Jordan play. And obviously Conor McGregor isn't the Michael Jordan of MMA as far as skill sets are concerned. But he certainly is as far as like greatness and needing to see live. If I can be on my deathbed in the, the way I treat my body in 40 years and say I got to see Conor McGregor fight live, that would be incredible. I, I feel like that would be an incredible experience. But we're not going to get to see that. We do have a new fight card. We have a new main event, a new co-main event, another featured fight that's brand new. Oh, this whole thing shuffled and shuffled around. Where I'm going with this, though, is that this is still a very good card. And this fight, the Ian Gary versus Michael Venom Page fight might be one of the best fights on this entire card. Certainly has some very interesting implications for the division. We have a prospect in Ian Gary fighting a veteran who is new to the UFC in Michael Venom Page. Two insanely high level strikers with somewhat different styles. And I'm here for it. Because we got Ian Gary. This guy's a very good striker, as we know. He's got crazy hand speed, fantastic footwork. He is hittable. We've seen him get hit. We've seen him get a little weeble wobbled. But he has a very impressive seven significant strikes landed per minute offensively. Solid enough takedown defense that he can keep fights standing. And while he does have power, it's not like big one-punch knockout power. What it is is incredible speed and timing that will catch you when you're not ready. Some say it's an easy road for him in the UFC. He has battled through some adversity, though. We have seen him in trouble. Song Kanan had this dude 99% knocked out. And then he reset, came back, and dominated the rest of that fight. He is coming off that close win over Jeff Neal where he was clear, clear that he was the more technical striker. But he's in for a chess match because he's taking on Michael Venom Page. This guy is a savage. He's been very successful in other promotions. He's certainly a few years past his prime at 37 years old, but he is still insanely dangerous, a very good striker with a sport karate background. His striking style is awkward and unorthodox, but it is very effective. He is insanely accurate and very powerful. He is very long and uses his range well on the outside before leaping in and working in his kickboxing. His takedown defense is solid, you're not going to see him ever attempt any offensive takedowns, though. He is coming off that win over Kevin Holland that was essentially a clinic in Michael Venom Page's creativity. One of the most impressive strikes you'll ever see landed in a fight was Michael Venom Page's spinning back elbow directly to Kevin Holland's chin. This is honestly, arguably, the best fight on the entire card. Two high-level strikers trying to advance in the division. Ian Gary is young, undefeated, and looking for actual credibility. MVP is established, but he's running out of time to work his way into a title. And while they're both strikers, they do have different styles. Ian is a calculated striker, but he's very traditional in his approach. MVP is very unorthodox. He lunges into exchanges. He spins, and he's very creative. If Gary was more of a brawler, I would actually be higher on him here. 
That's how Mike Perry, if you don't know, Mike Perry beat Michael Venom Page in a bare knuckle boxing, beat him. But he did it by just being an animal who constantly moved forward, stayed inside the pocket and kept it ugly. MVP thrives outside of the pocket so he can lunge in and lunge out. He can use that reach and that length. This is going to be one of the few fights where he's fighting somebody as tall as him, as long as him. Of course, Ian Gary is at Shootabox now. And Shootabox, as you know, they're brawlers, but they've got great jujitsu. They're an accomplished gym and they've been good for a very long time. It is possible that they're game planning here. And we're going to see Ian look to hold Michael against the cage, look to potentially work in some grappling. And that would suck if that's what we got. But I am going to pick Michael Venom Page here. We just watched him put on a clinic. We watched him spin and lunge and do all the things. Pressure didn't get to him. Nothing mattered. He looked great in that fight. And I think if Ian Gary is going to try to do what he does, which is stay on the outside, all that does is play into MVP's game plan. I am like, I'm picking Michael Venom Page to win here, but the confidence level is like, I'm not confident in that, but I'm going to pick him to win. I think the style matchup is very interesting. And I think Ian Gary is going to give him the space to work. That again, as I mentioned, if you go back and watch the Mike Perry fight, he didn't have space to work and he couldn't work. Michael Venom Page is going to be the pick and I'm, I am I love this fight. I'm curious what you guys think. I don't know if everybody's just like, Ian Gary, Michael Venom Page is old or if people are with me like, hey, listen, style-wise, he could absolutely get it done. I'm curious to see what the community thinks. Then we have a fight that everybody's trash and everybody's dogging. Look at this. How could this be on the main card? And I listen, I, uh, I'm 50-50. I don't disagree. It's absurd that this is on the main card. But it's not absurd that it's on the main card because it's women's MMA. It's absurd that it's on the main card because I don't anticipate this being a particularly exciting fight. But these are two fighters that are doing quite well. Myra Brena Silva just fought for a title. Macy Chasson is only a win or two away from a title. So there are title implications, certainly ranking implications in this fight. We got Myra Blaina Silva. She's a pretty good striker. She's got solid power, good kicks. She likes to charge forward and just bomb away. She's a very good grappler as well, but like so many others, she doesn't have the great wrestling to dictate if the fight stays standing or goes to the ground. She's one of the more dangerous women in the division though, especially on the ground. She is coming off that title fight loss to Raquel Pennington, where she only gave up one actual takedown, but she gave up 12 minutes of control time against the cage. She's taking on the insanely tall for this division, Macy Chasson. She's very tall and long, and she uses that length really well. She'll jab you up. She'll work in her Muay Thai striking. She does have a positive striking differential and okay power. The power is leverage. It's not just boom one-punch knockout power. If you do get past that length, though, you can have success staying in her face. But when she can keep distance, she's very good and technical. She has added grappling to her game plan, which is an entirely new skill set over the last couple years. She took down Norma Dumont six times in that win. And most recently, Pani Kanzad twice before a first round submission. And in theory, on paper, Myra Buena Silva should run away with this. She's powerful. She's a good wrestler. And she's got the better resume. But this new wrestling game plan that Macy has added is very interesting. Holly Holm had success holding Myra against the cage. So did Raquel Pennington. It's not going to take much for the much longer fighter in Macy to close the distance and keep Myra against that cage with a takedown or two mixed in. Myra is more than a two to one favorite and I'm going to go with the dog. I am picking Macy Chess on the win. In all likelihood, this fight is probably boring. It's probably a boring fight, and that's what Macy needs to do to win. Macy's not going to win an exciting fight. If it's an exciting fight and they're swinging punch for punch, Myra's going to win this fight. But if Macy comes forward, holds Myra against the cage, sticks with a game plan, we're going to be sleeping, but she's going to be getting that underdog win. I am picking Macy Chess on. I do think she wins this fight, and I'm watching the odds because I'm probably going to place a straight-up bet or a plus three-and-a-half bet on her. I'm watching the line movement tracker. It is a tool that we offer for premium and it's updated constantly. Every time you go to the website, you're going to get the odds and you're going to see is Macy Chesson becoming a bigger underdog or is that line tightening? If she's becoming a bigger underdog, I'm going to wait. Let's see how big it gets and then I'm going to hit it. If it is tightening, I have to hit it now. I may also wait for the prop bets because a plus three and a half 
means that you can buy one round on the judge's scorecard. And if this does go the distance and Macy loses a 29-28 across the board, I would still get paid. So let's check the odds. Let's see what direction they're heading. Let's see when those prop bets drop, typically on Monday or Tuesday, and then we can go from there. But I am picking Macy Chess on the win. I think styles make fights, and this insanely tall with the new style of wrestling can give her quite a bit of success here. Then we have one of the most mixed up fights we've ever had on a fight card. This was originally supposed to be Jamal Hill versus Carlos Ulberg, and that was only announced like a month or two ago. Then Jamal Hill dropped. So we got Carlos Ulberg versus Anthony Smith. Then Carlos Ulberg dropped. So now we have Anthony Smith versus Roman Delize, and I might have missed a drop or two in the mix. This has been a very wild ride for the featured fight on the main card. But this is still a decent matchup nonetheless, and we're going to get some questions answered. One of the questions is, is Anthony Smith still good, or did he just beat a very green, athletic, but unskilled fighter? Or we're going to find out how good actually is Roman Delize. Is he a grapple or bust kind of guy, or is he somebody that can go out here and beat a grizzled veteran in in Anthony Smith? Because Roman Delize, I just said grapple or bust, but he does have big power in his hands. But the grappling is very important. He's a world champion grappler. He has showcased those world champion skills on more than one occasion inside the octagon. And despite almost being the better grappler in every single matchup, he has no problems marching forward and just bombing, just absolute bombing punches. He has some very real power in his hands and he will get stuck in a striking match. He does tend to chase and that's what gets him in a little bit of trouble. He knocked a few people out and he's gonna chase that knockout. But he is a well-rounded fighter. He can knock you out or submit you. What he doesn't do the best, though, is have great game plans. He always has weirdo game plans where he's striking when he should be grappling or grappling when he should be striking. And when it's time to grapple, he essentially lets you dictate. He doesn't very often come out here with a grapple first game plan. If you look to grapple him, then he's in grappling mode. If you're going to strike with him, he's in striking mode. What he doesn't do very well is jump between the two inside of a fight. It's not like he's like one, two, drop and shoot. What he does do is like, bomb. Oh, you grab me? Time to grapple. And it's going to be interesting because I don't think Anthony Smith is going to be shooting takedowns in this fight because Anthony Smith, as we all know, is a grizzled veteran. He's insanely tough and he's a pretty good striker. He's got great kicks, good technical hands, and he also can grapple. Is he on Roman Delize's level? Absolutely, of course not. Of course not. He's not a world champion grappler. What he does though is have very solid MMA grappling with submission wins over several ranked fighters in the light heavyweight division. He's 35 years old, and he has been in some absolute all-time wars. If you never saw his fight with Glover Teixeira, Glover beat this dude. He took 20 years off his life, knocked teeth out of his mouth, and then picked him up and handed him to the referee, handed his own teeth to the referee. The referee held his teeth while he continued to fight. That speaks to his toughness, but it also speaks to the wars that he's been in. He was just knocked out real bad two fights ago. And that's what makes this interesting because Roman Delize has knockout power. And Roman Delize has got a little bit of Kelvin Gastelum in him where he can get beat on and just continue to move forward. He's not a quitter and he's got a very good gym. So now we have a far better grappler who has insane power in his hands and a very good chin against a very gritty striker in Anthony Smith. I think Roman Delize can win this fight. And if I were capping this fight, I would have had Roman Delize at minus 120. Made sense to me, right? Yes, he's going up 20 pounds in weight and it is short notice, but he's a big guy. I mean, they're basically the same height. Anthony Smith is 6'4", Roman Delize is 6'2". 6'2", is still tall. So it's not like he's 5'9", shouldn't be at me. No, he's very big middleweight. So out of camp, walking around, light heavyweight, fine. No big, I'm not worried about the size. I'm worried about the game planning, the thought process. Because Anthony Smith, in his last fight against Vitor Petrino, lit his legs up early. Lit Vitor's legs up. That's why Vitor went to shoot a takedown, because his legs were getting chopped up. If Anthony Smith lights up Roman Delize's legs, Roman Delize is very, very tough. But it may be more of the same. The problem, though, Roman Delize is not Vitor Petrino. He's not getting guillotined by Anthony Smith. If you start to hit his legs and he says, I need to wrestle, and he can take Anthony Smith down, it's a whole different world on the ground. I am going to pick Roman Delize in this matchup. He's a two-to-one favorite right now. That's crazy. He should not be a two-to-one favorite. He should not 
not be a two to one favorite. So I'm probably not going to bet on this fight. What I was hoping to bet every single fight Roman Delize has ever been in, my bet has always been wins inside the distance, decision, no action. And basically what that means is if Roman Delize finishes his opponent, you get paid. If he loses a decision, you get a refund. And that's a great bet for a guy like Roman because he's very dangerous. He can finish people, but he's also insanely tough. So if he goes out there with a dumb game plan and loses, it's all right. It'll be a decision. You get a full refund. But if he finishes, you'll get paid. But he's a two to one favorite. So we don't have the odds for the win inside the distance decision, no action bet yet. But I imagine they're, they're not going to be good. They're not going to be favorable. If they're somehow good, I'll place it. But if they're, if that's a minus 350 bet, I'm not doing it. Either way, I am going to pick Roman Delize. But this is a, these odds are gone. They're just gone. We'll see what happens. Maybe they'll get bet down because people are going to look at Anthony Smith and, all right, he's the actual light heavyweight and Roman doesn't have the best cardio to begin with. And, hey, if he gets bet down, I'll look at it a little closer. But as of right now, where it stands, just not going to happen. Then we have the new co-main event of the evening. This is not a fight that was shuffled. This is not a fight where we had a new opponent. This was a brand new fight. Conor McGregor dropped. The UFC looked at this card and said, uh-oh, this is a terrible fight card. So they said, we need something. We need something meaningful to be added to this card. So they went out there and they built a brand new co-main event on two weeks notice. They have Brian Ortega taking on Diego Lopes. Again, this is a brand new fight. Neither one of them were expecting to be on this card. Neither one of them are expecting to fight this week. Neither one of them... We're ready to go in any way whatsoever. But they both got the call. Do you want a co-main event? UFC 303 on International Fight Week. And they both said yes. Then I'm happy for it because this should be a really good fight. This should be a really fun fight. We're going to learn a lot about Diego Lopez here. Because he's taking on Brian Ortega. Brian Ortega is an OG in this division. He's a phenomenal grappler who, like so many others, doesn't have the best wrestling. It's only 23% or 27% accuracy. But he's got solid offensive striking Defense needs some work, but he is insanely tough. He's hit with almost seven significant strikes per minute, which is a very high number. He can be hot and cold in his fights, which makes breaking him down even harder. Even in his last fight against Yair Rodriguez, he was destroyed, but he hung tough. He gritted through it and he worked his way to a win. He is a nasty grappler who is very tough. He cannot be counted out of a fight. And he has 20 times the cage experience that Diego Lopez has. Regardless of record, you're going to see Diego Lopez actually has more fights, but eliminate that. Brian Ortega has fought some of the best featherweights in history. He has been in there with some of the best fighters that have ever walked the face of the earth. He 100% has the more experience at a higher level. But this is going to be a very interesting fight. Do we have a changing of the guard here? Because you could argue Diego Lopez is Brian Ortega 2.0. He is also a very dangerous grappler who, despite being so young, is actually coaching some of the better fighters coming out of Mexico. And while he doesn't have the best takedowns himself or takedown defense, his BJJ is insanely dangerous. He's a well-rounded guy who likes to throw heavy power shots and chase finishes. His striking can get wild, but he keeps things in combinations and he will just methodically work forward until he has the opportunity to just uncork and let his hands go. He's coming off that KO win over an accomplished striker in Sadiq Youssef. This fight, as I mentioned, is new to the card. It's a great addition, and it's brand new. Hopefully, the short notice aspect of this doesn't screw anything up. Because I'm going to break it down as if they had full camps. But they obviously didn't. But I have to assume that they're both ready to go, and, and whatever disadvantage short notice has will be on both sides. They both are at a disadvantage. Two high-level grapplers who are willing to bang. My question to you, who do you think the better grappler actually is? If this was a Naga competition or ADCC, whatever the hell, if this was a grappling competition, who do you think would win? I don't know. I would assume Brian Ortega because of the takedowns. Diego Lopez's takedowns are not very good. So I would assume Brian Ortega would win that because he would get the takedowns. But I don't think any of that matters because this is a fist fight and not a grappling match. And I think Diego gets it done. He has a ton of power. He has insane cardio. He's got plenty of swagger. And I think there's a changing of the guard here. I think Diego is going to be a star. There is something to be said about confidence and aura. And Diego hopped in at UFC 300 short notice-ish. That was 
like a month or two. So not short notice, but he basically won a fight and they're like, dude, throw him on UFC 300. This kid's going to be somebody. He walked in there against a phenomenal striker and outstruck him. And now it's like, hey, who should we tap for a co-main event? Let's get this kid that only has, what, three fights in the UFC. Let's use him. And of course he said yes. And the pictures on Instagram, this dude is yoked up right now. So I think Diego Lopez is going to come here more confident than he's ever been. The spotlight doesn't seem to bother him whatsoever. And I think he's going to beat Brian Ortega. So I'm going to pick Diego Lopez to win this fight. And I have a bet on him. A full unit bet at minus 150. And I'm feeling pretty good about it. I think Diego Lopez is going to be the next big thing. And if you have been watching this show long enough, you know that I was a bit of a Diego Lopez hater. When he stepped up on short notice against Evloev, I was like, yeah, Evloev is going to smoke him. And Evloev beat him. Didn't smoke him, but took him down relative ease. Then from that point forward, I was like, well, he's a grappler that doesn't have very good takedowns. His takedown defense sucks, so he's going to get... But no, then he's out striking people. Then he's out grappling people. He's doing everything. So he has proved me wrong, and I'm putting my money back on that side. Diego Lopez is the pick. I have a bet on him, and I got it at minus 150. Then we have the new main event of the evening. We lost Conor McGregor, and Alex Pajeda is here to save the day again. This guy, I don't want to say saved UFC 300 because I thought it was a pretty good card, but basically saved UFC 300. They had no main event that made sense. And then they reached out, and Alex was like, I'll do it. Why not? And he hopped in and had an all-time knockout in the main event of UFC 300. And then he's just been living life since then. Traveling the world, hanging out with Pollyanna, doing the things. And I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe he was in Australia, just hanging out, doing shoeys with Tai Tuivasa. Actually, he refused to do the shoey, but his coach did with Tai Tuivasa. And then got the phone call, can you please come save UFC 303? He's, All right. Why not? And that's what makes legends legends. Alex Pajeda has been in the UFC for three years. Three years. That's it. Three years. And he's a legend at this point. It is crazy. His rise from relative obscurity to saving two high-profile pay-per-views is insane. He obviously was an incredibly accomplished kickboxer multiple division champion in kickboxing. He had beaten Israel Adesanya several times. And so they took that and they built off that. And then he came into the UFC, a couple fights later, knocked out Israel Adesanya to become the middleweight champion. Loses the rematch, goes up to light heavyweight, becomes the UFC light heavyweight champion of the world. He is a two division champion who has been in the UFC for three years. As we all know at this point, he might be the hardest puncher in the entire UFC, regardless of weight class. He's absolutely tremendous at six foot four. He's big for light heavyweight. I don't even know how the hell he made middleweight. And he's fighting Yuri Prohashka in a rematch that he won already. But Yuri Prohashka is no slouch either. He is the former light heavyweight champion of the world. And he's a crazy person. He's got crazy eyes. He will move forward and fight like a psychopath. It doesn't matter what he's hit with. As long as his brain is not hitting the side of his head and knocking him out, he will stay vertical and he will swing. And he will try to win fights. There is no quit in Yuri Prohashka whatsoever. Even the fight he lost to Alex Pajeda. It was, I think, it was a justified stoppage, but a lot of people feel it was early. Yuri still had his wits about him. They stopped it a little early. And that's where you're going to get with Yuri. Until he is fully unconscious on the floor, he is coming at you like a rabid dog. He's insanely hittable, and that is a problem. Certainly a problem in this matchup, but he has power in his hands, and he has a never-say-die attitude where he will continue to march forward no matter what. But I am a little disappointed in this fight. And I don't want to be a crotchety old man about it, but I don't love this fight, and I don't love it for a few reasons. One, the outcome in the last fight was pretty clear. Even if you think Yuri was stopped, you know, the fight was stopped early, nothing was going to change in the 20 seconds following that, right? It wasn't stopped early like he was still vertical and we're like, what are we talking, what happened, right? I mean, he was, there were problems there. And what I'm worried about here is that Yuri Prohashka might turn into a wrestler. He might turn into a wrestler. He has takedowns in three of his five UFC fights, including against Alexander Rasik at UFC 300. And this is a title fight. And you're stupid to not to try to go out there and win a title fight. Forget being excited in a title fight. You need to win that fight. 
Because once you have that belt, it changes everything. You get pay-per-view points on the next fight. Like, it changes everything. So Yiri might come out here and just lean on Alex and shoot takedowns and try to out-wrestle Alex. And it is very hard to beat somebody twice. Look what happened when Alex fought Izzy. And that dynamic was a little different because he was losing the fight and then knocked out Izzy and then got knocked out in the rematch. And we could have something similar here. It is very hard to beat somebody twice. Obviously, it happens. But Alex Pajeda is a talent. And I would have preferred if it was Alex Pajeda versus Tom Aspinall or Alex Pajeda versus somebody at heavyweight. I want Alex Pajeda to go down as one of the greatest fighters that has ever lived. I want to see the first three-division champion, and I want it to be Alex Pajeda. But first, he's got to win this fight. And I do think he does. It is a rematch. He won the first time. I can't just go ahead and pick Yiri because, ooh, beating somebody twice is hard to do. And that was me making fun of my own voice. So I'm going to pick Alex. He's connected before. I think he can connect again. And I think we should all appreciate the fact that he stepped up on short notice and did this. And we should appreciate Yuri for doing it as well. But keep in mind, Alex is the one with something to lose. Yuri has nothing to lose here. He already lost this fight. He's not the champion. Alex Pajeda is the champion who just fought a few months ago at the absolute peak of his popularity. Has everything to lose in this fight. So I'm happy that Alex stepped up. I'm happy I get to see him fight live. And I think he wins this fight. And I hope after he wins this fight, the UFC gives him some sort of heavyweight matchup, whether it's a title shot or just a heavyweight in general to knock somebody out. I want to see Alex Pajeda as a three-divisional champion. I think he wins this fight. Hopefully his next fight is at heavyweight. Guys, that is the breakdown. Thank you so much for watching. And as one of the ways I want to thank you is I'll give you 50 bucks. And I know that sounds stupid and it's a weird transition, but the reality is this is affiliate marketing. And I could just push the links and tell you to sign up at wewantpicks.com slash bets and just keep all the money to myself like a greedy little mouse. But I don't. You use the link, you sign up, you make a deposit, we verify your account, and then we send you 50 bucks. So go to wewantpicks.com slash bets, use the link, sign up, make a deposit, and we'll get you paid. You can then use that money to become a premium member. Premium member is going to unlock everything you could want or need heading into a fight week. You're going to get the safety parlay, which has been dominating pay-per-views. You're going to get tools like the line movement tracker. You're going to get the detailed data metrics and analytics. You're going to get the DraftKings optimizer that builds lineups for you. And you're going to get even more than just me and Handsome Jake. You're going to get Artem breaking down regional shows as well as PFL, Bellator, and UFC. You're going to get the artificial intelligence picking fights based solely off of historical data at a remarkable accuracy. Every single one of these things and a million other things that I didn't mention are available right now for you at only $10 a month. Just go to wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top.